Welcome to Reflecting Light. This podcast is about feeling the world with light by exploring myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the works of artists, past and present, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And now, here is your host, Mandy Green. Hello and welcome to Reflecting Light. I'm your host, Mandy Green. It's awesome to be here with you. And so much goodness coming up today. So today we have this wonderful opportunity to talk about finding Christ in Great Britain. And this is the first tour I ever led. And it has a very, very special space base in my heart. I think it's the first tour I ever went on as a participant. And how it came to pass is really interesting. But I have a deep love for these sites. And so what I wanted to do is talk to you about why I travel. I think this is an important piece of who I am and why I travel and what I learn when I travel. And that it's considered by me an investment because I cannot think of anything you do. And I mean, anything you do where you're a different person 12 to 14 days later. So for me, it has the best return on investment. But I understand that so many of our listeners are not in a position to go, do you know, I, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. And then I'd like to take you on tour with me. That would be heaven. That would be heaven if I could just take anyone who had the sincere desire to be there with me. Unfortunately, we live in a world where these things have expenses. And so for those of you who are not able to go on tour with me, I wanted to walk you through the tour and give you a virtual tour of some of the amazing things that are out there and maybe give you some threads to pull Now, the benefit of travel is that we're able to take it beyond the podcast or even the classes. And maybe you've been listening to the podcast for a while, or you've taken one of my classes. And in doing so, you are beginning to understand how important it is to uncover your truest self and understand and begin to fulfill your divine destiny in the world today. And you've tried studying more intently, you've listened to lots of points of view, but somehow you aren't able to answer the deep questions that you have inside. This desire and frustration kind of builds, doesn't it? You kind of think, oh, I don't know. But then it starts to eat at you and you think, oh, this isn't the time to do this. Let me tell you right now, there's never a perfect time to travel. I've never seen it. But when enough of those locks line up, jump through that opportunity. If you have an intention to travel, you just need, I'd say, a little more than half, 60% of those to line up. I've never had the experience where heaven parts and angels sing and say, this is the time. But I do say when enough of the pieces are there, I'm going to take these opportunities. And that's what you need. There's never a perfect time. Your family will never be in the perfect situation And if you wait till you're 60 and retired, your ability to take on some of these sites really is different. I have this great meme that says, don't wait until you're retired to travel. And it shows two people just dead asleep in a gondola in Venice. And so if it's something you'd like to do, I would set your intention. I would set your sights on it. I actually like to build a vision board And look at those pictures because that's a thing that my heart started to tell me that I needed to see these sites. I studied the humanities and I was so wildly jealous of my friends who got to see these great works of art. And I just read about them in books. And so if the time's okay, then I would try it. And if you're not at that point, but you want to, Tell that to heaven. Say, here is what I want to see happen. Put those pictures up. I have my dear friend, Kim. She's been donating plasma 
And she just said, I want to go to Israel. This is my thing. And anyway, again, I'm not saying there's one perfect way, but if you're not able to, my intention today is to walk you through this tour and maybe open your mind up to some of the things that are out there that you can explore by book and look on site. And when we go in May, I will be posting on Instagram and we'll do little videos and everything I can to bring it to you. I'm also going to be releasing the Bloodline of the Holy Grail class after I return from that tour because I want to have a lot of on-site learning and show you some of these places, even if it's by video. The world is a wonderful, beautiful place. So for a little bit of background, I don't know if I've ever shared my story with any of you. I was just at that same point where I was searching and there was a hunger and there was a thirst inside of me and it wasn't getting filled. And I didn't even know it was there until I went to Rebecca Stay's Old Testament class because my friend Kathy Mallory told me I would love this class and I put it off for almost a year and something just lit up inside of me. And that's when I realized I was starving. I was totally spiritually dehydrated. And so I loved her class and that led me to study biblical Hebrew. Well, after studying biblical Hebrew, I thought, I want to take this further. And so my teacher, Carly Anderson, said, well, there's this program at Oxford. So I was trying to get into Oxford, which I have failed at three times. And then I noticed that I needed to up the ante because I had been out of school so for so long. So I decided to take a class at Hebrew University in the summer of 2014. Now... When I talk about travel never being perfect, I am speaking from experience. I had a vision board up. I had a picture of Masada up there and Jerusalem, the old city. And I just thought, I have to get here. Well, it was not the perfect time to go. I have three children. My youngest, I believe, was eight at the time. And I had a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old. My husband, who really is the better parent of us as far as like seeing to daily needs, uh, but he was working full time and it was in the middle of the summer. Everyone was home and all of the reasons why I shouldn't go were very strong. In fact, Brent ripped through his thigh muscle and needed surgery, but we didn't know that at the time. So I'm looking these these decisions in the eye and... I just thought, full send, I just have to go for it. I got so much heat. Now that I think about it, you you ladies who are getting heat, I got so much heat from neighbors and family members even saying, what about your family? What about your family? And I thought, have you ever had this conversation with my brothers? Have you ever had this conversation with any of the men in our area that travel for business? No. And it really incensed me. I thought it was ridiculous. And I thought it was ridiculous to think that my family wouldn't survive without me for five weeks. Of course they would. And I had to fight all of that hate. I had one super sweet neighbor, Fenny Ma, who came over and she's like, you just go, you just go. And Kathy, I had a lot of sweet neighbors, but I had a lot too who were like, how can you do this? Well, I show up. And there's a Gaza crisis going on. Now, if you don't know anything about Jerusalem and Israel and Gaza Strip, that is thousands of years old. Needless to say that missiles were being fired on the old city. Right as I got into my taxi, my taxi driver said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I don't know why you're here. This is not the time to be here. As we got to Hebrew University, there's there's several armed guards. There's several checkpoints. And he's trying to drop me off as close as he can because I have all these bags. It's the middle of the summer. And come to find out that I found out what an air raid siren sounds like in the apartments at Hebrew University. They have one apartment that's a bomb shelter. Needless to say, not the best time to visit Jerusalem. And yet I have to say it was the perfect time for me to visit Jerusalem it was the perfect time. I learned 
so much about myself. And in those first four days, I got there on a Thursday, then it's Shabbat, everything shuts down. My phone wouldn't work. I couldn't get internet. I hadn't even been able to call my family and tell them I had arrived safely. And when I finally got internet, I told my husband, I can't do this. It was way too intense. It was way too much. It wasn't what I expected. And I asked my teacher, are we even going to be able to see the sites? Because we had to change some of the sites we were visiting because of conflict. And I remember just that night praying while, and I wasn't sleeping at all at night, right? (laughs) You're not sleeping because you're jet lagged and you're scared. And I remember thinking, there's a reason I came out here. And I met these two young men, Jordan Rigby and Justin Moses, whose names I praise and I will forever be grateful to because I woke up, I didn't want to go to church. I was so down. I was just lost. And I woke up late and I thought, oh, I'm already late for church. Well, something said walk to church. So I walked 30 minutes to church. It was a scary walk for me. I didn't even really know where I was going. I just saw it on the hill and tried to find it. And that's where I met Justin and Jordan. And they said, oh my goodness, come to our house. We have Wi-Fi. Call your family. We'll feed you. We'll take care of you. They were my friends and I needed friends. And all of that happened when I was sitting there in the middle of the night thinking, you are insane. What are you doing here? And then the other stronger part of me said, there's a reason you came out here. There's a reason you came to do what you did. There's a reason you came here. And so when I talked to Brent, he'd been on the phone with Delta trying to get me home. And I just said, honey, you are the best. I think I'm going to try and stay. And that decision changed everything about my life. Staying there was not easy, but as I slowly worked my way through it, I got assigned to a co-ed dorm. That was interesting. Anyway, I survived. And then I thrived. There was a part of me that came alive during that time that would not have come alive had I been in a peaceful situation. And I don't know how to explain it. And I still don't really even know how it plugs in. But something in me came to life and loved being there. And it's changed everything about the trajectory of my life. So for whatever it's worth, I felt prompted to share a little bit of my past. Now, because of that experience, I came to understand that there's nothing like being on site. And so I'd been a participant on this Traditions of Christ tour with Legacy Tours. And I went to Chris Kimball, who is an owner of Legacy and helped design this tour with Dr. John Hall, who did the original tour and is a great, great instructor and human. And I said, I have all these people who would love to go on the Traditions of Christ in Ancient Britain tour. How do we do it? And she said, well, I'd love to. I just don't have a guide. Would you be interested in guiding it? And that's how it all came to pass. So here it is, the virtual tour. It's about the bloodline of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. And you know that I believe she was the bride of Jesus Christ. I believe that they had three children, two sons that were with him when he went into Jerusalem in that triumphant entry. There's one record that says there were two sons with him. And then she was pregnant at the time. And after his death, they went to Egypt to be safe. And Sarah was born there. So this tour is specifically going to look at where this story of Mary and the children and Jesus show up in Britain. Now, our biblical text drops off at age 12. And then it shows up again when he's 30 years old. So there's an 18-year gap there that I believe someone painted a picture and we think he's running a furniture store with Joseph. I'm not sure, but 
let's remind ourselves of who we're talking about and about his tremendous virtue and strength and power, and that he has to grow from grace to grace, as the Gospel of John says. And so I believe this is a time of learning and tutoring. Well, it turns out that according to this tradition, that Joseph of Arimathea is Christ's great uncle. And he is the brother of Anna, who's the mother of Mary, the mother. And he took Christ into Glastonbury, England, where he had this lucrative tin trade. And it was there that he met Mary Magdalene, and they were married. And so our first stop is at Glastonbury Abbey. Now, I've been all over the world, and I don't feel anywhere the way I feel at Glastonbury Abbey. It's my experience that heavenly events leave repercussions in the earth, and something happened there. And so we explore the Abbey. It's considered to be the burial grounds of King Arthur and Guinevere and Joseph of Arimathea. There's a special church to Mary Magdalene. And there's also the spot where there was a Wad and Dabal church that was built, and it says, from Jesus to Mary. And people assume that means Mary the mother. I have a different take on that, but we'll look at that site. There's this huge abbey that was built over the site. It's now in ruins, but we'll visit the abbey. We walk through it. We go down into the crypt. We go to these burial sites. And what I love to me is that it's a sacred space. It really, the entire area is walled off. It's quiet. I like to take my shoes off, depending on the season, and let my feet touch the earth and think about why this place feels the way that it does. For me, it does echo of this magnificent marriage taking place. Bride's Hill is not far from there. We'll visit Bride's Hill and we spend the afternoon exploring the Abbey. The next day, we visit Glastonbury Tour, which is right up the hill from the Abbey. Tour means hill. And up on top of Glastonbury Hill is this amazing view that you can see from all around. But the tradition there is that it's this Celtic PowerPoint and that you can see all of the signs of the Zodiac from that point on that hill that Christ was educated and that it's like a giant clock. When the water comes in, it makes this perfect zodiac that you can learn from. There's all kinds of stories about there being a maze inside of the hill. And as you ascend up the hill, you take this very specific path or it's there's a circuitous path. There's an Avalon orchard garden. This is the spot that's said to be ancient Avalon. And you can see if the water came in, that it would completely surround the tour, that the tour would just be this landmark that sticks out. So we look at these tales of King Arthur and Guinevere. We look at it as Avalon, this mystical in-between place, this place that's not really of the earth, has a more ethereal feel to it. All of that's part of Glastonbury tour. We also visit the town of Glastonbury, and it's just a really fun place. There's all kinds of interesting shops because there is a really unique feeling in Glastonbury. It's known for its position on these ley lines. Now, let me tell you about ley lines. Ley lines occur when there's water in the earth and electricity in the sky. So the water creates this magnetism and the electricity in the sky creates this energy. And when those two cross, then you get this intense sensation. Well, Glastonbury is the crossing part of the Mary line and the St. Michael's line. And even as I'm recording this, I just got a text from Chris Kimball 
saying that the UK opened up to unvax this week. So if you're unvaxxed and wanted to go on the tour, hey, let's do this. That is awesome. So anyway, these two ley lines intersect at different places all throughout the country. You can look it up on a map, look up ley lines, the Mary ley line and the St. Michael ley line. And did you know that there are churches at every spot where these ley lines cross? One of them is Wells Cathedral, where we spend the night. And Wells Cathedral also has some very, very interesting esoteric things inside of it. It's right on the same ley line. It's part of this tradition. Down the hill from Glastonbury Tour is Chalice Well. Now, Chalice Well is the seat of the Divine Feminine. Now, I would say the tour is a very masculine landmark for obvious reasons and the well is deep in the earth it's a source of water and it is a place of worship for the heavenly queen or the mother figure since 25 at least 2500 bc and so we also visit chalice well oh gosh there's two springs that come out of chalice well there's one that has a very red water and a white spring. So you've got the red spring and the white spring. And that's very symbolic. You're going to see all of these designs that reflect this intersection of heaven and earth. The gardens are immaculately maintained as we make our way up through each of those springs to the actual well. And you'll see all of these snail imprints on the stone and they make this divine spiral. If you know anything about divine measure, it's all over there. And this snail spiral is showing you about this golden measure and ascent and going up. And all of that is part of this beautiful, peaceful place called Chalice Well. And I love that they're right next to each other. Literally, they exist side by side. And that's just the first two days of the tour. <laughs> Next, we visit Stonehenge, which is a giant cosmic clock. You'll know that the light comes through the lintels right at the winter solstice and the summer solstice. It tracks the sun. It's a solar calendar. And we'll look at how these stones were brought here, put in place, and right nearby is a man-made pyramid, which is really interesting to me. In our minds, we think that these ancient cultures aren't connected at all, that what's going on in England has nothing to do with what's going on in Egypt or what's going down in Peru, when in fact they show many of the same markers. Many of the same markers. Which leads me to believe, A, there's definitely a similar source, but B, they're probably interacting with each other, which is really, really kind of super cool. So we look at that at Stonehenge. We eat lunch at a pub that Charles Dickens went to. It's got the thatched roof. You just have this delicious, I love the pies in England. These meat pies, these puff pastries, they're really quite fantastic. And then we spend the rest of the day in Avebury, which is two sewn circles, but the orientation is to Orion and Sirius. Now, what's so neat about this is Orion in Egyptian religion represents a Christ figure, if you're looking at a Christian tradition, and Sirius is the dog star. It's Mary Magdalene's star. It's the star of Isis. It's the one that dips and returns. And we're going to walk through Avebury, and I love Avebury because you can actually touch the stones. You can walk around. It's a very, very beautiful place. From there, we drive into London because we've got to look at the Hermetic tradition in London. We Our first stop is at Temple Church. If you've watched the Da Vinci Code at all, it does show Temple Church. It's right there on Fleet Street in the financial district, but it is also tucked away and it's built in this pattern that's known to be linked back to the pattern of King Solomon where you've got a long nave, but then you have a circular tower. 
And Temple Church follows this pattern. And so we visit Temple Church. It's built by the Knights Templar. I'll introduce you to their statue. From there, we will walk across the Thames. We'll take that awesome bridge and walk across to the Globe Theater. There's a lot of evidence that Shakespeare knew about sound and light and dimension. And so we'll look at the Globe Theater. Now, when they rebuilt it, they didn't perfectly follow the plans. So it doesn't conduct sound and light the way that the original globe would have, but we look at the structure. Did you know there's three levels to the globe theater? Then you have the ground level. There's trap doors to show you the underworld. There's things above the stage to reflect the heavens. Shakespeare knew a lot. And when he introduces music, for instance, into his plays, it wasn't because he needed a song. He was trying to create a certain resonance. He was trying to do something with those in the audience. And that's something to look at. If you're a theater buff, as Shakespeare writes, he's trying to teach you, particularly The Tempest, I think would be a great example of perhaps other worlds, other dimensions, other characters, gods or goddesses. And then it's your option to end the day at even song at St. Paul's Cathedral, built by Christopher Wren, who was a great hermeticist who followed in this tradition in a more esoteric tradition. And even song at any church in England is amazing. Again, light and sound, you're going to look at how the sound resonates in this particular space, why it's built on the space it is, what its orientations are, all of that matters. So we have a little nice reprieve there in London. Now, unfortunately, on this tour, we don't spend a lot of time in London. If you've never been to London, I recommend flying out early or staying later because you're going to want to see more of London. From there, we go to Cambridge and we look at the home of Sir Isaac Newton talk about light and sound and the building blocks of eternity, Newton had it figured out. We take a boat ride on the Cam, which is the river that runs around Cambridge. We tour King's College Chapel, and we have Evensong there in King's College Chapel, which is a really beautiful experience. It's still candlelit. And again, you're going to look at how light and sound interface with the structure. There's a piece of stained glass there. As I was pondering this tradition, as I was a participant on the tour, I happened to be seated right across from a stained glass that had Christ coming down on Palm Sunday. And what I couldn't believe, but it's right in front of my eyes, is in the stained glass, there are two little boys in the picture. Now, This tradition is not one that you could pronounce or show overtly because the Catholic Church has become so powerful, and that's why we really don't have a lot of this documented, or we don't have all of the writings and the records of this because it's all been hushed up, it's all been squelched, it's been destroyed, it's been ruined, and so in particular, the artists like Shakespeare and Christopher Wren and those who built King's College Chapel are giving you clues about their tradition in the artwork. And so you're going to be looking for clues. We're kind of on a discovery tour. And as I start pulling things out for you to see, I'm just going to pull those threads and let you look at them. And hopefully this gives your eyes greater training in a way to look at it. Maybe you'll see or hear something unexpected like that. And there it was right in front of my face. So that's one of the great things about King's College. We also visit the Round Church, which again is going to follow the same pattern of this Temple of King Solomon, the same pattern of the church at Glastonbury Abbey. And it is the old original structure. It's one of the oldest structures there. And we spend some time in Round Church. And then we give you lots of time to 
explore Cambridge. It's just a delightful place. And you can eat at any of the pubs. I mean, come on. Sitting down at an English pub is probably one of my favorite things. And if I ever design a home, the kitchen has to be, well, I think I'll have a French kitchen, but then I'm going to have this like hobbit hole nook down in the ground that has a fire and feels like an English pub. Because the delightful thing about a pub is you are made to sit there and enjoy. There's no someone's waiting for your table. There's no... I need to get you going. Literally, my wonderful friends and I would sit and just track about what we had seen, trying to digest what was there. And honestly, that's one of my favorite memories of this tour is that time at the end of the day to sit in a pub and reflect and think and digest and laugh. And they have Diet Coke on tap a lot of times. So come on, it's awesome. We'll also visit Lincoln Cathedral, which was built by the Templars. And it's said to be the ascent place of Mary Magdalene, the place where she ascended back up into heaven. It's also the home of Alfred Lord Tennyson. I've talked a little bit about how his art and his poetry may reflect some of this tradition. The Lady of Shalott, for example. And so we we visit that Um, Sherwood Forest, we go through Sherwood Forest, which has everything to do with this tradition, right? You've got the outlaw and Maid Marian and Prince John trying to steal the throne. I mean, come on, great stuff. Also in Lincoln, you can visit Lincoln Castle that has a copy of the Magna Carta. And then just for me, And hopefully for some of you, the Austin aficionado, we are going to visit Lime Park. Yes, we are going to walk into Pemberley, well, as it's portrayed in the movies, and have tea and pretend that Fitzwilliam Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet are somehow wandering the grounds. From there, we go up to Scotland. We visit Temple Village, St. Mary's Abbey. We stay in Edinburgh, usually right downtown by Holyrood Palace, where Her Majesty the Queen of Scotland resides. And there's plenty of great pub and castle and shopping opportunities there. We visit Stirling Castle and the Bannockburn Battlefield, which is where Scotland gained its independence. And it's also said to be the last spot of the Ride of the Templar Knights. And if you've never heard a Scotsman recount this tale to you about how Robert the Bruce came down, well, that's one of the treats of my life. It was amazing. So we'll look at how the Templars, that's the last sighting of them, and then they just disappear. Were they obliterated or did they go somewhere else? Hint hint teaser trailer. And then we end at the crown jewel of this whole tradition, which is Roslyn Chapel, Roslyn, Rose Line, following the Rose Line, the line of the Rose. Mary Magdalene is known as the Rose or the Lily. And as the Templar Knights were evicted from France, many fled to England. They were safe in England until the King of England had to say, well, we technically are supposed to get rid of you, but we won't, but maybe you should be safe. So they go up even further north to Scotland. As a teaser trailer, yes, this is about the time the St. Clair family, which is always the owner and host and keeper of Roslyn Chapel, St. Clair family starts to show up in the Americas. And that's a whole nother story. I feel like we'll have to do that sometime. But uh, we end with Roslyn Chapel and we spend the whole day there. Roslyn is a visual assault. Every part of that chapel is carved or painted and it's full of symbols and it's full of signs. And my first time there, I didn't even have time to just even acclimate. So we spend plenty of time there. I'll walk you through. It's also kind of about being in the space. Again, I can give you threads to pull, 
But how that's going to be communicated to you on a deeper level is is your thing. So we'll walk you through Roslyn. And then I also want to visit the Glen, which I've never visited. Once again, stone is very masculine. It's kind of harder for me to get a vibe in Roslyn. But when I walk through those glens and those woods, as a, as a girl, that's much more feminine. The water, the foliage, the earth, that speaks a little more to me. Rock's very masculine. We give you both sides of Roslyn. And then our tour ends. I hope this has been fun. I hope these are maybe sites you've never even heard about or traditions you've never heard about or maybe something I've spoken about has sparked your interest and you've thought, you know what, I need to learn more about Lincoln Cathedral. Now, all of these Gothic cathedrals have these stunning rose windows. Lincoln has a tremendous rose window its orientation matters. It's said that light comes through the rose window on the feast day of Mary Magdalene. And so we'll look at that. I mean, all of these places we're visiting have ties to this tradition, have ties to this story about the bloodline and those who swore to protect the bloodline or are part of the bloodline. And so that's who it's for. If you want to know about it, if you want to learn about it, Hopefully I've given you enough little things that you could research it. You could look at it. If you are able to come, we'd love to have you come. We're going this year and then we're also going next year. And so if you're not able to come this year, but you're thinking, I need to do this. I mean, quite honestly, I sold my soul to go on this tour. I had half the money, but I didn't have the other half. And so I took this job teaching homeschooled kids in an echoey dance studio. It was one of the worst experiences of my life, but hey, it paid for this tour. So I hear you, but we're going again next year. So for sure, get on the wait list and maybe that would give you time to work toward it. Uh, There's nothing like being on site. There's something about being able to feel. There's something about the friendships that you make on a tour It sounds crazy, but because you're not distracted by life and you don't have all of your normal stuff that actually time spent together, you become very close to certain people. And I think that's a wonderful benefit of traveling with us. You get to see more of the world. England's really nice because the language isn't different. And so you shouldn't feel as as lost or out of your league, but any type of travel is going to introduce you to new points of view, new ways of looking at things. You'll see that other people were really more the same than we are different. Most people are good. Most people would help you. Most people care about families and good things. That's always a a great thing. And again, lastly, what it does for you personally. I know there's kind of this stigma, particularly for women, and I don't know why, that it would be selfish or crazy to go off and learn about something like this. And I hear you. I've heard I've heard most of it. And I don't care. It's changed my life. Being at Glastonbury changed my life and changed my trajectory and how I felt and so many things now. You totally don't have to go with me. You can do any of these things by yourself. I'm not saying that at all, but travel is a beautiful investment wherever you do it. And to end, I'm just going to quote these words that I know I mentioned them a couple of weeks ago, but as I sat in that apartment in Jerusalem with crazy stuff going on around me, I had taped to my wall a handwritten, markered, note from my 12-year-old son who quoted Walter Mitty to me. And I looked at that so many times a day as a reminder of why I was there and what I was doing. And everywhere I travel, every tour I lead, I'm always going to mention this. To see the world, things dangerous to come to, to see behind walls, draw closer to find each other, and to feel. That is the purpose of life. 
And that is why I travel. Because I want to see things. I want to see behind the walls. I want to draw closer to other people and to heaven. I want to find like-minded souls who are probably old friends that I just haven't met yet and to feel. So I hope you enjoyed this little trip down Britain and Scotland with me. I hope if any of this speaks to you that you will do some research. I'm going to have to put together a pretty extensive book list for these show notes, so I better get on that. But I'll put a bunch of books out there. There is not... And I don't know if I've said this before, there is not one book you can read. If you look in my library, I'm looking at about 30 books, just just about England, not to mention the other 50 about the bloodline. So unfortunately, there's not just one source you can go to. I really need to work on writing my own book so that I could give you one book, but even then it wouldn't be one book. Who are we kidding? If any of these threads speak to you, pull them. And if you've got your eyes set on anywhere in the world, it sounds like it's opening up and gosh, dang it, jump. Take that opportunity, whether it's domestic or international, if you have an opportunity to go learn and grow and see something different and breathe different air and learn about something new, take it, take it. So with that, I leave you with love and light. Thank you for joining us for Reflecting Light with Mandy Green. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a good rating and share it with your friends. And remember, your light makes the world a brighter place. Share it.